Baylor and TCU. One team hopes to go to the playoff. The other team, by God, the Alamo Bowl will do. This is a crossover edition with Locked On Baylor and Locked On Horn Frogs. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Game week between the Baylor Bears and the TCU Horn Frogs. Thank you for making Locked On Baylor or Locked On Horn Frogs your first listen every single day. Whichever respective fan base you're coming from, I'm Drake Toll from Locked On Baylor alongside Stephen Simcox, Locked On Horn Frogs. And Stephen, this game, I refuse to call it, the, call it the rivalry. That's too much for me, way too clunky, but still a rivalry game. 61 58. And the dominance of, I think TCU's won four out of five or something. It, it's, there have been waves upon waves of up and down roller coaster in this roller coasters in this rivalry and that's what's so beautiful about it but this Saturday you get what should be a lopsided game but instead TCU is only favored by two Stephen what does Las Vegas know well I mean I think it's just that every TCU game has been a dog fight I mean they haven't yeah. really pulled away from anybody in Big 12 play since Oklahoma um, in, in their kind of conference opener they've now they've won some games by double digits but even like the tech win they were trailing going into the fourth quarter, um, you know, West Virginia, like the Mountaineers had the ball down three in the fourth quarter and had a chance to go tie it or take the lead. So I feel like they're just sort of looking at that. You know, I, I don't, I expect Baylor to bounce back this week after a really bad performance against K-State. I would just yeah. think Dave Rand and the staff have too much pride in the players. I mean, it's a good program. They're not going to lay down and just let TC roll them over. So I think that's a big part of it. I mean, this has been a wonky series too. Like, the roles are reversed a little bit. Lately, it's usually been TCU kind of coming in looking wounded and not necessarily having a ton to play for, and Baylor is the team that is maybe playing for a Big 12 championship berth or playing for a college football playoff berth, and the Frogs may be able to play spoiler. So it'll be – I'm curious to see, like, what that role reversal does for the effort and intensity because I, I don't know why. I just think TCU is maybe taking this game a little more personally the last six or seven years. Yeah. It could be that 61-58 loss. Like, maybe that was what spurred them on. I know Gary, um, that bothered him a lot, a Coach P. So, I'm not sure how that translates to Sonny Dykes. But, um, yeah, I just feel like it's a combination of rivalry game on the road and a TCU team that um, is 10-0 but hasn't really blown the doors off anybody in, in Big 12 play so far. Steven, too, to introduce this TCU team to Baylor fans out there, I, in the preseason, thought this team would be a bottom feeder in the Big 12. I was not alone in that assessment amongst media members across the Big 12. They expected TCU to be middle of the pack, if not bottom of the pack, under Sonny Dykes in year one. Instead, they are now 10-0 and and are, are on the cusp of vying for a college football playoff. Why? Where did this come from? What makes TCU such a dangerous team, and how did Sonny Dykes flip this roster so quickly? Well, I undersold them, too. I thought they'd go 7-5, and five, so I had them maybe a little higher than most people did, but I didn't see this coming. Um, and honestly, when he got hired, I was a little underwhelmed because I just thought, like, okay, this is the guy that it seemed like the moment that they parted ways with Gary Patterson, that was the name that everybody mentioned. And it did make a ton of sense. He was in the Metroplex. He's an offensive coach. They were kind of trying to change their identity, get some more excitement around the team. And I felt like, okay, this is a dude who could probably get you to bowl eligibility pretty quickly. I'm not really sure what his ceiling is after that. Um, the thing that surprised me most about him, and I don't know if it's you know the players he's inherited or just something that I missed while he was at SMU, this is a physical football team. Like I, I think yeah. they're actually best at running the ball between the tackles with Kendra Miller and Amari D Mercado. That's not what I would have predicted at all before the season. And I feel like it's just the coaching staff kind of playing in to the cards they've been dealt. Um, you know, they, they just look more um, intense and they've been a good second half team. Like they seem to lean on people. I think they kind of let their offensive line um, do the work during the game. And then in the fourth quarter, it really pays off. So that's been something that I didn't expect. And I don't know, they're just tough minded. I mean, I hate to like speak in cliches, yeah. but they do have the ability to take a punch and get back up. You know, they were down by uh, 18 against K-State. They're down by 17 against Oklahoma State at home and they found ways to win. And, you know, they've been in some tough matchups with teams that maybe they were expected to beat by bigger margins and they still pulled out victories. So um, that's been the thing that surprised me the most is just kind of, some of the intangibles that he's brought there, but 
I think, you know, he did a good job in the transfer portal. There weren't any names that just like jumped off the page, but guys like Jared Wiley at tight end, and you know, they brought in some defensive linemen, um, like Caleb Fox and Tymon Mitchell, who have filled some roles for him. So they did a nice job of, of kind of piecing this together. And it was a talented group. I mean, they were still recruiting like in the top three or four in the Big 12, even when they were putting out mediocre seasons towards the end of the Patterson era. So I think he did inherit a, a team that was ready to win right now. They got a lot of juniors and seniors. On the flip side, so that's that's what's made TCU so good. And obviously Max Duggan is now kind of the dark horse Heisman that everybody loves. I myself have raved up Max Duggan for the last three or four weeks because he's the coach. I'll be the best water boy you've ever had. I'm not transferring. And now has put up a historic season uh, at a university that's known for great quarterbacks, but dating back to slinging Sammy Baugh. You thought I wouldn't bring that one up. Oh, Ooh. I did. Good, uh, good reference there. Yeah. So where where are the weaknesses? If Baylor is going to win this game, where is TCU going to have to crumble or what do the Bears exploit? So the offense has slowed down the last couple of weeks, and it, it seems to be they're really struggling to deal with teams trying to heat up Max Duggan with blitzes. So, you know, you've seen some a lot more simulated pressures from Texas Tech and Texas. I think also those two teams just have really good defensive lines, which Baylor yeah. is, is in a similar camp. So I expect Dave Aranda to, to try to exploit that. Um, TCU's going to have to find a way to deal with it. Now, defensively, I, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I would have said that was one of their weaknesses, but they really tightened that up lately. Yeah. And I don't know if that's just matchup based or this team kind of getting used to what Joe Gillespie is asking them to do. Um, but they they played really well against Texas, obviously, holding them to three points offensively. So I think if Baylor's going to win the game, they, they're probably making Max uncomfortable in the pocket and, you know, putting this offense behind the chains. And then um, on the flip side of that, can Blake Shapin and these receivers get on the same page again and and get some big plays in the passing game? Because that was something that teams were able to do earlier in the season. It hasn't shown up as much lately. But, I mean, I think there's still opportunities there if you can find a way to, to uh, pick on some guys in the secondary, even though they've kind of gotten healthier as the season's gone along. <clears throat> Steven, Max Duggan is – I, I remember being in high school and watching Max Duggan. I am now a senior in college and still watching Max Duggan. I, yeah. He's been there forever. And has, like, wh where did this come from? Why is Max Duggan all of a sudden this world beater, 25-plus touchdowns with hardly any turnovers? Right. I mean, it, it's funny. Like, the first couple of years of his career, I think if you were describing him, you would talk about how good he is with his legs and how tough he is and hard-nosed, and you probably wouldn't get to throwing the football until you were pretty far down the list, Yeah, which is obviously an important thing for a quarterback. I mean, I think his accuracy has improved. Um, this offensive line has gotten better. Uh, you know, the big issue offensively, they, they have some weapons. I feel like Doug Meacham was their play caller the last couple of seasons. Who He's an air raid guy. Like, that's his background. And then they also had Jerry Kill on staff. Yeah. as like the head coach of the offense. He was an analyst and he's a big 10 guy. I mean, like mm -hmm. much more old school football, fullback, two tight ends, let's run the ball. And so I think they were trying to do a lot of different things on offense and they weren't doing any of them well. And so now they have a pretty clear identity. I mean, they're going to take shots down the field. They're going to use their speed on the edge with bubble screens and jet sweeps and then run the ball with their running backs. And so that's helped him a ton, but, um, yeah, I think the biggest difference is probably the way he's taking care of the ball. I mean, as you said, only two interceptions. He had a really, I mean, it was unlucky, but he fumbled, he botched the handoff with, with Kendra Miller against Texas, tried to dive on the ball. Texas ended up having a scoop and score, but, um, he hasn't turned the ball over the season. That's been a big part of their success. And they finally found a way to kind of maximize guys like Quentin Johnston and Darius Davis and Tay Barber, some of these players they've had on the roster for a while. They just haven't found ways to get them the football. So all in all, it's been a great season for him. And it's crazy to think that Chandler Morris won the job out of out of camp yeah. and really only played one half of football before Max uh, stepped in there after he got injured and, and just never looked back. Steven, last question before we kind of get the TCU questions that those Horn Frog fans will have for, for Baylor or about Baylor. Uh, Hypnotoad question mark. Yeah, so, I mean, if – I don't know. You're a little younger, Drake. Did you watch Futurama growing up? Was that part of your catalog? I did watch Futurama growing up. I wasn't allowed to. So, Mom, you're yeah. finding out about this now, but I did. 
Yeah, I wasn't either. That was definitely something on Adult Swim that I probably should have been watching in my room. But I would I would occasionally turn that on. And so it's it's originally from that. It's just a random character in an episode. Uh, they started doing it at basketball games when other teams were shooting free throws. And then they incorporated it in the football games. At first, it was like when the opposing team was kicking a field goal. And Coach Dykes really liked it. But I don't think people really realized it until it got on a hoodie. Like he wore a hoodie. Yeah. Um, I think it may maybe the West Virginia week, that that game week, and it just took off on social media. And so now it's become like the unofficial mascot. There's, you know, uh flags. It's it's sort of like the angels and the rally monkey. Um, so hey, everybody's embracing it. When you're winning games, you just embrace all the goofy and silly traditions. And so coach, I mean. Sonny can't do anything wrong. He's 10 and 0. And so if he likes it, everybody yeah. just gets behind it. Works for me. House of Duggan, Hypno Toad, I'll take all of it. It's swagger. And as a college kid, I like swagger. I also like Nugenics. Trust me, <clears throat> Steven is not going anywhere. I just want to tell you about Nugenics. Because right now, look, if you're getting older, uh, your body starts to slow down. As a 21 year old, I get this. I, the beer gut is starting to set in. You get the old like dad bod thing. Uh, the body slowing down is like less so. I'm not there yet, but we're getting close. That's why I've already started to look into Nugenics and even future health. And right now, if you feel like you can't get in shape, it's not always your fault. As men age, your body naturally loses free testosterone. So when winning felt easy, Getting back to that is even easier. The winner's hormone, the man hormone, testosterone, it right now, Nugenics has this total T, which contains man boosting key ingredients like testophen, validated in five different clinical studies. So, right now, get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total T when you text college, college to 231. 231- 231. Text now, get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, their most powerful fat incinerator ever. Key ingredients to help you get back in shape fast. Absolutely free. College 231 231. College 231 231. Get your complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea again by texting college 231 231. Steven, what would a frog want to know about a bear? Man, I love these these philosophical questions you throw out there. Hypnotoad question I've been around mark. Dave Aranda for far too long, Stephen. Two <laughs> years sure. is enough. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna you're gonna hit up some children's stories here in a minute that really take us to a different place. Um well, so I want to start with this. K State at home. Sorry, I know it was it was a, a tough so night. Bad. Terrible. But blackout, I mean, people are revved up for it. Suddenly this Baylor team seems to be kind of hitting its stride and it's an opportunity to control their own destiny. Big 12 title game is still on the table. So Drake, like what what happened? What went wrong against the Wildcats that led to such a lopsided uh, you know, ending to that game? Baylor in many ways is like a Mac team. If you ever watch some Tuesday night Mac action, you're watching the Baylor Bears because once a Mac team gets down by 10, 14, that's it. Call it. We're done. And for Baylor, if they get down by 10, 14, they're done. The The main reason why is because they found their identity in running the football. Last season with Gary Bohannon at quarterback, they wanted to run the football. They wanted to run it. Uh, the more they had to throw, like in the TCU game where it became a shootout, the less Baylor had a chance to win. So what Kansas State did was they put – Force Baylor to turn the ball over. And the second Baylor turns the ball over and that equates to points to their opponent, the Bears are going to lose. So what happens in this game, Baylor doesn't force turnovers. They have turnovers forced upon them. And Blake Shapin just doesn't have the confidence or the arm at this point in the juncture to bring a team back. So against K-State, Deuce Vaughn ran all over Baylor. Um, Will Howard comes into the ball game instead of Adrian Martinez, kind of what you saw for TCU, where the Frogs are, are ready for the running quarterback, and then Will Howard comes in and just starts throwing dimes all across the field. Baylor got tore up by that the entire ball game, and once that high flying, big powered offense came came alive for Kansas State, that was it for Baylor. And from that point on, it was just a let's let's roll over and not even score a touchdown. Which might I say, Stephen, bold call for the Bears deciding not to score a touchdown and expecting to win. Few have done it. Iowa has. Baylor did not. So you mentioned Blake Shape, and, and I remember when he was getting recruited, the word I, I remember about him was he was more of a baseball guy. And so yeah. I was I was surprised. I, I heard kind of the rumblings of, hey, this, this dude might have something. Right. And I kind of blocked it out. But then he goes and wins the job from Gary Bohannon, who was the quarterback of a team that won a Big 12 championship the year before. Yeah. Um, is... Is the ups and downs just as simple as a guy who's going through some 
first year, you know, hills and valleys, or or what's your confidence level at the moment with Blake Shapin as he, you know, closes out this regular season the last couple yeah. of games of the year? Steven, my confidence is like a 2 out of 10, and that's because Blake's confidence is a 2 out of 10. That's the mm-hmm. issue. A lot of times these quarterbacks, it becomes a game of, oh, your first couple of games were really good because opposing teams didn't know what you're, they were getting. They had not scouted you. So Oklahoma State in the Big 12 championship, they had film on them, but not enough to be able to stop them effectively. And now you get into this season, and there are big-time Big 12 coaches who have a ton of film on Blake Shapin, and they, they've exploited that. He's got a young wide receiver group, too. So for Shapin over the course of this year, it's just like a, a, a big – a big, big roller coaster. He'll throw for 345. He did against Oklahoma State, and Baylor lost. He'll throw for 145, and Baylor will win. They just need him to be the best quarterback in America at handing the ball off. If he can do that, Baylor's going to be in a good place to win any ball game. And so I don't have a lot of confidence in him, but I'll say this too. The most popular quarterback in America, unless you have a Heisman caliber quarterback, is the backup. In every university, the backup is the guy. Just put him in and we'll start winning games. And that's what it was with Gary Bohannon, Charlie Brewer. You remember Jacob Zeno, Charlie Brewer, Gary Bohannon, and and Blake Shapin, and now Blake Shapin and Kyron Drones. And so this running back room is is really talented. I mean, yeah. I think a lot of people thought Squirrel Williams would be the guy, and Richard Reese has come in and, and sort of supplanted him, but they still use Squirrel. They'll use Quaylen Jones from time to time. Um, on Richard Reese, one, I guess, is he the biggest surprise, like the biggest kind of pleasant surprise on the roster for the Spaler team? Mm. And then is, is he healthy, Blake? I know that they've – or excuse me, is he healthy, Drake? I know they've kind of – scale back his workload a little bit is that just them trying to save him or what's going on there yeah you had a freshman that was had carried the ball almost 70 times in two weeks and against Oklahoma with Squirrel Williams back and healthy and Quaylen Jones also taking some carries they thought they could temper the workload of Richard Reese which worked out well the Bears ended up winning that game we were talking about how Reese was like 90 yards away from beating out Lake Seastrunk for the greatest freshman running back in Baylor history as far as yardage and touchdowns go and he just kind of stopped the last two weeks. Uh, They have certainly taken away some of the carries from him and given them to Squirrel Williams, but I don't believe it's a true injury. He's had the flu the last couple weeks, and that has plagued him, which has been there. But, I mean, you know, you saw the kid from LSU this week, I forget his name already, who had the flu and went off. I mean, there are flu guys. I don't think that's what's what's really hampering Richard Reese. They're scaling back his carries a bit, and against Kansas State, again, Baylor got in a point where they threw the ball 38 times. They don't want to do that. And that took away carries from Richard Reese, which ultimately really hurt the team. So great running back, really solid. But the last two weeks, Baylor has struggled to get him going. Defensively, um, Dave Aranda, Ron Roberts, you know, that's what they do. That was a huge part of their success last year. I know they lost a lot of guys to the NFL. Um, How would you assess the defense in 2022? And are some of the struggles just as simple as having some some youth in the secondary or or kind of what's been – um, the tale of their season. Yeah, it's weird that we're talking about Baylor's defensive struggles when this was supposed to be the unit coming in. I want to give those guys a break in that we didn't truly factor in the loss of Jared McVay and JT Woods and Jalen Petrie and Terrell Bernard, what that would do to this team, because it's certainly taken a huge uh, a huge toll on the defense. But still, you had Dylan Doyle and Matt Jones and Siaki Ika was the world beater and Garmin Randolph and Jackson Player transfers. They're big names all across the defense. Uh, Christian Morgan, too. And they've just been been kind of disappointing. The biggest reason why they can't get off the field on third down uh, against Oklahoma, again, a win, OU is 10 for 15 on third downs. That's not good. That's not good at all if you're the defense. So the fact that teams are converting so well on third and fourth down against Baylor is the true issue right now. They are great on first and second down, but the second it gets to third down, Max Duggan will likely run all over this D, uh, which has been disappointing because this was supposed to be a world-beating unit, maybe the best in the Big 12. So I follow you on Twitter, and your handle's right there, at Drake's T-Toll. If any of our Frog fans... If if you didn't know that TCU lost to Northwestern State in basketball earlier this week, Drake will, you know. will remind you. He'll, he'll gladly kind of kneel you a little bit. That's good. That's good for the rivalry. Um, but I've I've seen that you have kind of a quiet confidence, or maybe yeah. just this idea of like, hey, Baylor's got nothing to lose this week. Mm. Let's lay it all out there. Let's have fun. So if if the Bears get it done, if they pull off this upset, which by the Vegas spread is you know not much of an upset, right? What has to happen? for Baylor to bounce back and win this football game. Steven, 
I'm going to answer that because it's a perfect segue into segment three. But Ooh. first, I'm going to tell everybody about Bet Online. And you're going to help me too, I'm sure. Because, Steven, you know Bet Online better than anybody else. Bet Online's the best. Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to make money, Drake. And it's, it's the best place to wager on all your, your, your games and your sports needs. All the sports needs. Podcasts are there. Live lines are there. Live betting is there. You can go and do like little casino games and stuff, which, speaking of, my fraternity brothers all went to the casino last night. They went to Windstar last night. Oh, well, went in college, right? Wednesday night. Hey, you guys want to go to the casino? And you just drive three hours to the casino. Not myself. I am sane. So I, I've been podcasting and doing homework. But Bet Online, even better, it's like a casino, but on your couch. Mm-hmm. BetOnline.net. Go there today. Check it out on your mobile device as well. That interface is wonderful to even look at and check out lines at BetOnline.net. Steven, if Baylor's going to win this game, I have no idea. I like, I, there has to be so, like a miracle has to happen, but not that far fetched of a miracle because history would tell us some interesting things. There have been two Big 12 teams in the last decade to start 10 and 0. 2012 Kansas State, 2015 Oklahoma State. Oddly enough, both of those teams played their 11th game against the Baylor Bears. Kansas State got blown out in Waco to drop to 10 and 1. In 2015, Oklahoma State lost 45-35 at home to Baylor to drop to 10-1, and and now it's TCU who comes in at 10-0 to Waco. The last team to go 9-0 in the Big 12. May I present to you the 2021 Oklahoma Sooners. They lost to the Baylor Bears 27-14 in Waco last season when Baylor rushed the field twice. Something about this Baylor team, even when they're not good, they find a way to knock off really solid teams and just ruin their season because that's like the character. Once Baylor gives up, Stops caring about Big 12 championship or big time bowl game. They play so much more loose. They trip these teams up that have high aspirations. And a big, what, what I said on a podcast earlier this week, Baylor players right now, there is no pressure. Why? I present Baylor players the Alamo Bowl, the Texas Bowl, the Liberty Bowl, the Meineke Car Care Bowl, and the Arizona Cactus Bowl. Steven, two of those bowls don't exist. If I was to give those five bowls to the player, to a player, and be like, which one do you want to go to? They'd be like, I don't care. Ah, that's a. Yeah. TCU, on the other hand, they are like college ball playoffs right there. Big 12 championship. And I think that gives Baylor like this calm, confident edge. And Vegas thinks so too, obviously. No, I, I mean, I, I see the point you're here. I'm, I'm nervous about this game. And I don't think it's just because I have a lot of Baylor people in my life who would give me heck if they lost yeah. or if TCU lost, namely my mom. But um, at the same time, I think this TCU team, They've been battle tested. I feel like yeah. this would be a close game. I wouldn't be surprised if the Bears come out motivated. Maybe that, yeah, they do throw the kitchen sink out there, trying to mm-hmm. get the taste out of their mouth from last week. I feel like ultimately, though, TC will follow the script they have all year. That physicality, that O line, that running game will take over at the end. I think TCU covers. I'll, I'll say they win by seven in Waco and get to eleven and zero. Drake, I, I know how you feel, but give us give us your official prediction for big noon kickoff in Waco on Saturday. I have three predictions. I never do, I don't usually do the three prediction things. I get this like a cop out. But number one prediction, and I think this is probably the most reasonable. I really do. Baylor goes up 17-3, 17-7. And you're thinking, holy crap, this is it. Armageddon, it's gonna happen. Baylor loses 34 to 17. That it just feels like TCU's that team that rises to the occasion when they have to at the end of the game. Maybe they give Baylor a good first half and then just romp them in the second half. I I think that's the way this probably will go. The other prediction is that just wild Baylor wins it thirty one to twenty eight. Uh, you know, TCU's got a last drive to go win it. Max Duggan gets him to the two yard line and Baylor does something wild and gets a big play to end it. That, that is like the Vegas has TCU favored by two. That's what this feels like, uh, from a, from just that calm confidence standpoint. And then I think the most reasonable, the most reasonable, if you are an intelligent human being, you think this is the truth. TCU wins 45 to 10. Like that's just what should happen on Saturday. I, though, am going to side with option number one. I think Baylor jumps out to a big lead, ends up probably losing this game by 10. If I'm going to be an actual objective sports journalist here, I am gonna I am going to go like 31-21. TCU ends up winning this game, 31-24 in that range. I just think the Frogs are they're too good in the end. They're too clutch in the end. I don't. I, if TCU is going to lose a game down the stretch, it's going to be in Arlington to likely Kansas State. Uh, not this week in Waco. But if it happens... Uh, you, you, me and your mother will be, we, we will dog you all day. Cause I, I really do believe that Baylor's, they have nothing. What 
they have nothing to play for but to beat TCU, and that's gonna yeah. that's gonna behoove them. You also make a lot of Tennessee fans happy too. So a lot yeah. at stake for Baylor folks this weekend. And Fox, look, big noon kickoffs coming to Waco, which it's it's like a not now, please read the room. We don't need Baylor just lost thirty one to three. Us Baylor people, we don't need the whole big noon kickoff thing. And they're not even bringing Gus Johnson and Joel Clatt. They were yeah. like, oh, yeah, you can have Big Noon kickoff. You just don't get the best part of Big Noon kickoff. Is Steven, this a Brando you, game? No, it's a Brock Heward game which with whoever Heward does it with. What okay. is the whole deal with Tim Brando? Brando was like, like, Brando might do the Super Bowl. And I just, like, Fox Sports won now? I see him on the most random games. I'm like, is that, is that Tim Brando in this FCS game? Hey, Tim. <laughs> Legendary. Um, I don't think it's a brand new game. Although you guys have had plenty of game days and big noons this season. Um, is that like the TCU fans get excited about that anymore? Or is this just what every week is like? Well, they keep doing it on the road. That's the thing. Now, big noon kickoff did come to Fort Worth. Uh, but yeah, it's cool. It's great exposure for the program. We have a coach that believes in talking to the media now. So that's like a, a complete 180 from, from, uh, comrade Patterson who really kept things close to the vest, but Gary did an outstanding job, and good luck in Austin, buddy. Does does Sonny does Sonny Dykes play the guitar? No, he doesn't. Oh man, you had me there for a second. That hesitation, I was ready. I had to think about it, but no, he could not shred with Coach P. Oh, dude, that those are the that was the best content. Like we've got a TCU Baylor week this year, and I'm just waiting to post like funny videos and things, and they're all Gary Patterson. I don't I don't know what to do. I have just been arrested by the fact that Sonny Dykes is a cool man. Why TCU had to hire a cool person, it hurts me. My girlfriend goes to TCU, by the way, so this week's a, this week's a lot for me. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Well, yeah. love love conquers all. Love conquers all, including the revivalry. It's terrible. I don't, it's terrible. Baylor keeps pushing it. It's just bad. Steven, uh, any, anything else before we wrap this thing up? I know we gave our predictions and, and kind of gave the rundown of these two teams. Anything that Baylor fans need to know or TCU fans alike? No, you can find the show at Locked on Horn Frogs. Uh, so subscribe to YouTube channel. Subscribe to Locked on Baylor on YouTube. And yeah, let's uh, let's let's have fun. I'll be there in Waco Saturday. So if anybody sees me, you know, feel free to give me a hard time or say hello, buy me a Dr Pepper float, whatever you want to do. Boom at Simcox Steven on Twitter or at Drake Toll on Twitter. And I should say, go to both of them, follow both of them, and the Locked On Baylor and Locked On Horn Frogs podcast. Thank you for making our shows your first listen every single day, respectively, whether you're a TCU or a Baylor fan. And this has been a crossover edition of Locked On Baylor and Locked On Horn Frogs.